So many of you all have come here today not knowing what the phrase Gen Z means. It is my hope that you will leave this presentation understanding what Generation Z is, how Generation Z has come to be, and why Generation Z is the way they are. But in order to understand how to engage with Gen Z, this first generation of truly digital natives, the folks that grew up with iPads and iPhones in their hands, let's take a little trip down memory lane. So around the year 2010, I was a teenager. And the cool thing for teenagers to do at the time was to share tweets with each other, send each other messages on Instagram in the form of pictures, or private message each other on Facebook. But, well, I wasn't one of the cool kids. I had a series of conspiracy theories about the world. I thought that there was some kind of big brother behind the scenes, pulling all the strings, putting us through some kind of social experiment, and we had absolutely no control over our lives. Turns out I was watching a little bit too much of The Matrix. <laughs> but it also turns out that I was a little right. Us millennials were the first generation exposed to social media. Our developing minds were exposed to social media prior to understanding how it was going to affect us. And boy, were we misunderstood. Here are some real newspaper articles discussing our generation, millennials. This one talks about how millennials aren't eating cereal because, well, it's too much work. <laughs> it talks about how lazy we are as a generation and how we don't appreciate the value of hard work in the real world. And here's another one that's a little bit less offensive. You know us millennials are extremely sensitive. Millennials aren't hypocrites. They just prefer to kill trees. <laughs> Once again, talking about our excessive consumption habits and how we fail to consider the consequences of our actions on the environment. Well, as you can imagine, on the developing brain of a teenager, I personally felt kind of weird, as well as a lot of other millennials. I felt like I was this awkward middle child of sorts, where I had a Generation X older sister who's rolling up your sleeves and really familiar with analog and knows how to make things happen in the real world. And then I have this Gen Z little brother who's age of Ultron, Iron Man familiarity with technology will make them more tech savvy than I could ever hope to be. So how did I feel exactly as a millennial? Something like this. <laughs> a weird mix of things that's not really that attractive to the outside world. <laughs> and not the best of both worlds either. And so I was trying to figure that out as a millennial, developing. What could I be the best at if I'm not the best at either of those worlds? Well, when I asked a member of Generation Z, this first generation of digital natives, he said, Google it, bro. <laughs> and it's funny that he said, Google it. That's what he'd resort to when he wanted to find out some information that he didn't know, a form of media. And interestingly enough, the average teenager today, who's also a member of Generation Z, consumes roughly nine hours of media per day. Now, what does that media consumption look like? Well, I can tell you, it's not just sitting there listening to the radio anymore or letting the TV watch you while you watch it. It's interacting with Twitter on threads and discussions with your friends. It's live streaming video games with your friends on a platform called Twitch. It's watching your favorite podcaster or YouTuber. Or maybe it's a good old Netflix and chill. <laughs> if you're not Gen Z or Millennial, you probably won't get that one. <laughs> so how can we use our knowledge of what Gen Z is doing, what kind of media they're consuming, to most effectively engage with this elusive generation? I started to figure out what the answer to that question was when I was traveling the country, exciting students about science and technology. I found out that what well, parents never understand has taken on an entirely different meaning with this generation. In the same article that discusses when teenagers spent nine hours consuming media per day, and the parent was asked, what is it that your child is doing? What media consumption are they performing? The parents said, they're doing whatever it is that they do. So in my time engaging with kids all over the country, 
exciting them about science and technology. Ooh. I started to realize some best practices for engaging this generation. I remember one particular incident, though, that encapsulates my entire experience with this generation in really one hour. It was a workshop called Silicon Valley 101, and it was a middle school class I was teaching. And so I asked this middle school class, how many of you guys know what Silicon Valley is? Raise your hand. No hands were raised. I said, what? <laughs> you guys don't know what Silicon Valley is? Come on, are you serious? How many of you guys have a smartphone? How many of you guys use a Chromebook? How many of you guys have a app that you use every day? All of those things are owed to innovation that's occurred in Silicon Valley. So I walked them through Instagram posts from the likes of Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg, and we engage via social media with the history of Silicon Valley. We talk about Moore's Law and the innovation of the silicone chip and how that's led to all of the progress that's happened today. Did you know that computers used to be the size of an entire room? Most of those kids had no idea about that one. So after that, I stopped talking at them. I started, to tell, I started to ask them to identify a personal problem, something that they were experiencing every day or something that their community was experiencing. From there, I asked them to develop a solution to this problem in the form of a prototype. Now, this prototype could have been hardware or software, but the most important part is that they pitched this prototype to me in an engaging way to pursue funding as entrepreneurs. I was teaching them how to be entrepreneurs. So after that, I had this fun little quiz game that the kids love. I've done this quite a few times now, and they always interact with it. They get online, they get on their phones, and it's competitive, it's time-based. They're always into it. So as I'm checking each kid's phone to see that they're logged in, okay, you good, man? Okay, cool, you good? I start to notice that kids are chuckling in the background. <laughs> and I wondered why they were chuckling. Well, when I look back at the screen, I found that there was an error message and that there were a few names on the screen that I didn't see in the classroom, about 9,999 of them. One of them being Poophead22, another one, Yamama50, and my personal favorite, Fart Daddy 44 <laughs> If you didn't know Gen Z, you never would have guessed that this would have happened. But in an act of juvenile delinquency, one of the kids decided to take it upon himself to hack into my quiz game and disrupt the classroom. And as you could imagine, the kids erupted in laughter. They thought this was absolutely hilarious. So the dean comes in, takes away computer privileges for the next two weeks. He's furious. But I personally, well, I was a little fascinated. I identified the culprit of the crime. You know that kid that's always laughing a little too hard? <laughs> yeah, I caught him. So at the end of it, I made some eye contact with him, and I said, hey, man, how'd you do that? And he said, well, I went on YouTube and I learned how to do it myself. Or as my friends and I affectionately refer to it, YouTube University. <laughs> He'd been teaching himself how to hack into things for about a month now, and I was just another person on his list of victims. <laughs> so as you could imagine, I felt a little bit like a failure with this class. The dean of students came in, the class was disrupted. I don't think they took away the entire lesson that I wanted them to. They didn't even want to engage with my quiz at the end. So it came to my surprise that I got positive reviews from the students. The next time I came back, the class was cheering because the science and technology guy was coming back in. And there's one statistic from a few years ago that may shed a little bit of light on this. It's from about 5,000 Gen Zers. It says 72% of Gen Z wants to start their own business. What? 72% of them want to start their own businesses. Now, this looks different from the entrepreneurs of yesteryear. They want to be digital content creators, and they want to figure out how to engage themselves with their personal brands. So I think that there are some huge takeaways from this one interaction that encapsulate my experience with Gen Zers. One is an emphasis on creativity and divergent thinking. Nowadays, because of the information age, the barriers to entry for creativity are reduced. No longer do you have to be a starving artist. I have real friends in real life that post pictures on Instagram that are graphic designers, 
and that's their portfolio. They market themselves on Instagram, and that's their full-time job, a full-time Instagram graphic designer. A lot of students look up to people like that. They aspire to be full-time graphic designers when they get older. So I suggest if you want to engage with them, you think about how you can equip them with these kinds of skills, because that's what they're interested in. Another emphasis that I placed on that specific lesson with Gen Zers was social media teaching, social media literacy. A lot of times, modern educational institutions look at social media as this radioactive weapon where we have to stay away from it at all costs and at the most, learn some etiquette, how to use it safely and securely. But other than that, well, don't touch it with a 10-foot pole in your classroom. And newsflash for you guys, remember, kids are spending nine hours on media per day, so they're probably in your classroom on social media anyway. So I suggest that you find them where they are and try to engage with them and teach them that way. Another thing I took away from this was that as a millennial, well, I found something I might be good at. Remember those articles that you guys have been putting out bashing us for the last decade? <laughs> well, it turns out because of our hybrid status, because of our familiarity with analog, VHS and cassette tapes, and our familiarity with digital, social media, Instagram, and Twitter, that we're probably the most qualified people for understanding Generation Z. So if you want to understand Gen Z, I'd say tap your millennial niece or nephew or student and ask them how they would do it. They might be able to give you insight that you never thought of before. Let's zoom all the way out here. A big takeaway from my interactions with Generation Z is to constantly approach them as a student to them. You are a student to Gen Zers. Because of their experience being inundated in the digital age, they're going to have a lot more practical life experience about what apps you should use than you probably will. As a matter of fact, I can't tell you how many times I've asked students, hey, man, like, do you think that's cool? Or what app do you use every day? And they've introduced me to some application that's made my life 20 or 30 times easier. The other thing I would suggest when interacting with this generation is trying to learn new stuff all the time. Remember that time when there were some people that said, I, I don't think this internet thing is worth my time, or you know, typing on this keyboard is probably not a wise investment on my behalf. Were those are the same parents and grandparents that are typing on smartphones with one finger today? <laughs> and I prefer to text with both of my thumbs. So you guys remember that big brother that was behind the scenes pulling all the strings that I talked about? Well, the little brothers behind the scenes pulling all the strings today are our generation Zers. So I suggest we pay attention to them like we've never paid attention before. Thank you.